Hello again, Jules fans. Welcome back to Jules in the Blood TV for another Jules in the Blood Chats 2. I'm happy to announce today, and you can see clearly on the screen yourselves, that I'm joined by 1990s uh, striking hero, Carlos Saba. Uh, Sabs, appreciate you coming on, mate. Hope you're keeping well. Yeah, all good. No, it's lovely to be on. Thanks for having me. No, I appreciate you taking the time. I mean, we just had a little chat before we pressed the record button, and obviously there's, there's not a great deal that too many of us can do aside from going out for an hour each day and, and going to the shops at the moment. But um, appreciate you coming on nonetheless. So uh, we'll crack straight on with the questions. I'll let you have a mouthful of tea first and I'll take that opportunity as well. I'm just I'm just looking at the questions. I'm just uh, You do know whose birthday it is today, don't you? Yeah, I did see it flash up. Yeah, I wished him happy yeah. birthday. Do we really he's, older have to than, he's older than you though, isn't he? So that's the main. Yeah, I know. But it's, it's got to go. I've seen the question about his five, so it's going to really be buzzing over this now. The club have just tweeted it out as well. Oh, brilliant. So he's had to be massive this morning. <laughs> anyway, we're not here to talk about Bob. We, we will come up, I'm sure, obviously, because you two spent a lot of time on the pitch together. But um, if we go all the way back to the beginning, pre jules And mm -hmm. uh, well, you started off at, was it Dagenham in non-league, I think, originally, wasn't it, Carl? Dulwich. I was at Dulwich while I was at uni. Dulwich, sorry, yeah. Dulwich Hamlet, that was it, not Dagenham and Redbridge. No. Oh, and then you, got, you moved to uh, to Brentford. Yeah. Um, before you all moved to Jules eventually at some point, it seemed. I know. Well, the Brentford thing was good. Um, obviously, that's where I met Ash, uh, Bobby uh, and Smudge. Um, and it all started from there. You know, the, the move that uh, me coming to Gillingham was a lot a lot of it was orchestrated by the boys because i was at reading and i was having such a horrible time there everyone knew i was unhappy yeah um and and to be fair pew pew tried to get me quite quite a few times in the first season as well um oh really yeah he, he's been you know he, he, he has a lot of faith and the boys for i think it was probably because they picked on me so much they wanted someone to bully in the dressing room so they were kept. They kept telling him to get me. <laughs> I'm sure you uh, gave as good as you got. Oh yeah, of course, of course. But still, I, I took a lot but, of flack. But yeah, you've mentioned obviously Brentford. You had a decent spell, and you you, you played alongside Bob and, and Smudge and Ashby. Like I think there was, I think Brian Statham was there as well for a time when he and he he pitched up at Jules as well for yeah. I think a season or so. Um, and then you got your move to Reading. I think it was 800. 800,000 at the time, wasn't it? In, yeah, it was something like that. It was a, it was which at the time, I suppose, was for that level, was, was a pretty huge fee, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the record. It was their record transfer. And um, it's the biggest, biggest, well, one of the biggest mistakes of my career because it, I sort of insisted I needed to move because we just lost. We lost in the playoffs and everything that looked like the team were going to be sold off. So I wanted to move sooner than later. And I right. didn't see us doing too well that season. Um, and I switched agents because I was a big, you know, I was Ian Wright mad. I was a Palace fan as a kid. And Ian right. Wright's agent contacted me and I met Ian Wright. And basically whatever, whatever they said went because I was blinded. And I ended up just signing for a team that really needed a an experienced striker you know they were going to struggle in the, um, the championship yeah he needed someone proven at that level to score whereas i wasn't proven at that level i wasn't used to that kind of player um so, yeah they was so they was the division above what brentford and jules were at the time weren't they yeah and they were struggling they weren't a good team they had some in you know great individuals but they were not a team, and I was used to the team effort uh, ethic yeah. where everyone worked for each other. But at Reading, it was yeah, you do it. You you know, I don't want to get stick in the paper. So it is the ball. I don't care how I give it to you. Once you've got it, it's your problem. It's and not my responsibility, type of thing. It was you know, it was a team of mercenaries. It was horrible. Um, and thankfully, my friends are, uh, from Brentford days kept telling Hugh that. Look, forget how he's done at Reading. He, he'll do the business with us as long as he's, you know, we give him a cuddle and help him, and they did. But you weren't, in fairness to you, and obviously you had all them issues, it seems, from what you've just told me, from the outside looking, and obviously in terms of research on the internet, there's not a great deal. Um, but on the face, you didn't even have a bad season, to be fair. 
I looked, you scored 12 goals in all competitions for Reading. And if, I mean, there's some effort if you weren't enjoying your, your football at the time. And I think in all them games that you scored, they only lost once. The rest of the games were either draws or wins for, for Reading. So it's not like you were playing poorly, was it? No, but I was a record signing. That That's the, the pressure that comes with that sort of thing. You're the record signing. They so know you've got to get 25, 30 goals, I suppose. Yeah, exactly. That's why they've scored to sign you. Whereas I was with uh, Trevor Morley, who was a great, really lovely guy. Great yeah. play, played at a higher level than I'll ever I got West to. Ham, I think, in the 80s. But he was at a different part, part of his career where he was looking to earn a new contract. And he wasn't looking to help this young lad who's got a three or four year deal, who's young, who's got his... It, it was just, just a horrible atmosphere and a horrible place to be, you know. Um, and I suffered from it and my football, I did okay. Um, I made some great friends, like the Linvoy Primus, Lee Hodges, and, and probably the most significant of them all was Alan Pardew. You know, who has been huge in my life, um, Pards, and, and he was a coach there. Yep. So so it wasn't all bad, you know, I was very lucky and privileged that, you know, I played for Reading, I'm not knocking it, you know, they're a great club, the chairman, Dr. Uh, Mr. Medeski was amazing, but yeah, I went missing on, on the, when I was supposed to sign, when I was signing for him at his house, because everyone knows I'm a car fanatic. And unfortunately, yep. at his house, he had a Jaguar XJ220 in a glass case and a few Ferraris. And when I was supposed to be signing, no one could find me because I was in the garage looking at the cars. <laughs> uh, it was ill-fated from then, really. Yeah, probably, yeah, probably looking back with the benefit of hindsight, you probably think, yeah, it weren't going to work, was it? But yeah. we're fast forward then and, and sort of forget that negativity. And obviously, Reading's loss was, was Gillingham's gain. And... You arrived summer 98, I think it was late August, for, for 600,000. Yeah. So I suppose in that sense, it probably helped us out because it got the fee down a little bit. Maybe if you'd had a belting season there and scored, well, you'd have probably stayed. But you know what I'm saying? If you'd had scored 20 goals, and it, we'd have probably had to pay a million or we might not have been able to afford you full stop. So, yeah. No, but, but a lot of work went, you know, a lot of hard work went in behind the scenes. Um, uh, after the shenanigans with the agent, I then just... My father took control of everything, just let me con con concentrate on football. Yeah. And he'd come to me and tell me what, what, what my options were. And my option was Gillingham. And I wanted to play. You know, it was, I want to go to Gillingham, Dad. These people are here. The manager really believes in me. They know what my football's about. Yeah. And I want to go. So it was just the chairman then trying to do is the hard work because my dad wasn't easy to deal with and fair, no fair play to to, to paul scully who, who i think the world of as well mm -hmm. he, he made it happen and there was some key people behind the scenes who, who made it happen and you know the next thing I, I was told on a friday friday i'm going down to Gillingham, and i'm signing and we're playing black ball the next day away and they're going to fly me up in a in a little plane the morning of the match. Yeah, so, it was a two-all draw, wasn't it, I think, up there? Oh, I can't remember. I was still crapping myself from the flight. <laughs> it was a two-all draw, so I promise you I looked oh, earlier. <laughs> God, I turned into B.A. Baracus. I didn't think they were going to get me on a plane for love nor money, but somehow they did, and we got there, and it, it was a glimpse into what life was going to be like. It was a hard match, and everyone worked their socks off, and... You know, I was just so happy to be part of it. Yeah, and I suppose, like like we've already touched on, it was probably made a lot easier by the fact that you knew sort of three, four, five players already, didn't you, from your time at Griffin Park together. So in terms of setting in, I suppose it was it was pretty easy, as opposed to if you'd gone to a club and you didn't really know anybody. Yeah, no, of course. And to anyone who had any, you know, preconceptions of what I was like, being, you know, six foot two and quite well built, that no one, no one had to stand off me because Smudge and Bob and, and Ash just took the piss, took you know, sorry for the language, That's just right, took no the me and messed with me and just messed around. And it was like, okay, he's one of us. We can do what we like. Pato Saunders, we all had, you know, we all, we all just good mates. It was, it was just great. 
I think that's been the, the general consensus that I've picked up on speaking to all of you and even like Popey when he came in, because obviously he joined a group that had already been together for a couple of years. And uh, he said it was just, he felt like one of the boys straight away. And he said, and he was a bit apprehensive, like not in the sense that he didn't believe he couldn't get in the side. He said in terms of ability, he thought he could challenge, but obviously he knew the likes of Guy and Ash and, and AD at the time, you know, had all been playing together for a couple of seasons at the very least. He said one thing that helped him weirdly was that AD picked up an injury. Yeah. Um, but he said in terms of just being sort of allowed into the group, it was seamless and it was like he played there all his life. And he said that was what everyone sort of encountered when they arrived. And it's, well, it's hope- probably one of the major reasons why we've so successful under, under you know, Tony and then Peter Taylor and, and Hesse as well for a period. Completely. Well, Ho- Hopi, I-, I love Hopi. You know, he, there was myself um, and Ippy and Nora. We, we had... Um, flats in Rochester next door to each other, um, right. the Mariners, and Rodney Rowe and Hopi, that was our little group. We used to, every night we're together, we're playing computer, whoever lost, normally me, had to go and get them at Flurries, and we we were always together, it was just so good, and Hopi, what an under underrated, not, not by anyone else, but by himself, he never understood just how good he was. He was, yeah. he was incredible. He yeah, was, was what, phenomenal, five, to be fair. 11, and he used to jump seven foot. You know, he, he was he was a little man mountain and, you know, just missing miss him dearly. Yeah, I mean, he's, up, he's up your neck of the woods, I think, isn't he? Or even a bit further. Cause I know because I spoke to him because he's a Borough fan, I didn't realise. But yeah, it was... Um, well, that's where all my family at my mum's side are Borough fans. So, yeah, where there was a lot of banter and there's Nicky Southall, Teesside Agro, you know. Um, <laughs> so, and that, it, we were all really close. There was so much, so much um, bonding as all. No, that's good. Right, home debut, first goal. Do you remember much about it? Other than that, it was a, uh, it was a Wrexham side that, that we thrashed. Hesse scored an unbelievable header in that game, if I remember rightly. I, <laughs> Excuse I me. Remember. I don't remember too much. I remember scoring. It was a score at the Rainham end, which meant a lot to me. Yeah. Um, and then all I remember was Amadeus. That's all I remember. Night out after. Not even there anymore, Carl. Well, thank it's all God. Shut down. So I think it's a bowling alley now. Probably for the best. Um, but yeah, that well, <laughs> yeah. We scored. Boys went out bonding, talking, and it that that was it. You know, it wasn't a great goal. Um, but by just the significance of getting that first goal, it didn't matter how it went in. The, you know, it's like okay, I've scored. I'm a striker. I've done. With, I mean, the goal. That's what you're doing your job. And like so, Bob said the other day, you don't get you don't get extra points for scoring a screamer from 30 yards. No. Then if you just scuff one in from a couple of yards, it's goals a goal, isn't it? At the end of the day. Exactly. So no, it got me off. It got me off from running, and um, you know, it allowed people just to let me integrate more and, and start relaxing yeah because i'm trying to yeah because bob was probably the other way when he bob came in and weren't fit and it took him a while to get going yeah well that was you were lucky in the sense like you say first home game in front of the old rain men scored instant yeah. hero probably whereas bob i know took a little bit of flack for a while but bob i mean once he got going he was incredible leader, as well yeah. Yeah, Bob was close to leaving um, when I when I came. I thought that because it was going through a bad time, and part of my signing was to un- unlock the Robert Taylor potential because Pew yeah. knew how good Rob was. Yeah, and it was like take the pressure off him, put another sign in there. If anything, get the pressure on Carl's shoulders just to unlock Rob. You know, let Rob go about his business without the eyes on him. And, yeah. And, you know, and it all worked and we spent lots of afternoons, you know, Pew, Pew loved me and Rob, you know, he, he gave us little tra- different training regimes. He'd have us I've, in. Heard this, I've heard the stories, yeah, so, yeah <laughs> the, you and Bob enjoyed it. I'm not sure the likes of uh, Hopi and Vince and Guy <laughs> were so yeah. fond of the fact that you were sometimes back indoors by half eleven. Yeah, but uh, and Ash, Ash and Smith, they, they all took the mic and, but they knew, they didn't care. As long as we scored... At the weekend, it was for the team, and you know yeah. it was all banter. And Pew just knew the best way of getting getting the best out of people. So is that why we had to pay an extra hundred thousand for you than than for Bob because he was struggling? 
Oh, well, I don't know. I don't know, but... No, I'm out of the car. I've only jested, obviously, with yeah. that one. It was just... You said that, obviously, you had to come in and take the pressure off, and it, it was but next door to the for you, and it was that, for Bob, so... It, it was, and that, that's how a lot of transfers are. If, you know, if someone sees something that's underperforming that could be worth a hell of a lot, you will pay over the odds for an asset that you know will unlock the better potential, and, and it, it worked for him. Oh, certainly did, yeah, because he obviously that second season just before he left, he was unplayable for about three or four months. He was, he was quite frankly, he was a joke. To be honest, it was, it was ridiculous the rate he was going. Over the three or four months when I was sat with stitches in my groin and in my belly, yeah. with the sour taste of, taste of watching my strike partner score from fifty yards whenever he, whenever he wanted, you know, wonderful. He did feel time. that at the time, didn't it? I think everything he hit just seemed to go top corner or bottom corner and literally every shot he had would seem to go in. Uh, unreal. Um, it was a pleasure to, to watch now. It was a pleasure to watch now, but when you wanted to be with that person and say, look, you know, I'm there want, as well. I want some of the glory. It, it was, yeah, it was because you are. Once When you're not playing, you're forgotten really quick. And the last thing I did was score at Wembley and, and that was it. You know, I'm yeah, we didn't see you for five, six months, did we, after that? But completely. So, But no, he was just incredible. That, you know, he was always brilliant. But that, that second season before he went to City was just the best I've seen. I've said, and, um, and I said it to him, and I'm, I'm, again, and I'll pay you compliments as well, because your partnership together was, was brilliant. It's probably the best strike partnership I've seen watching the Jills. But I've never seen a footballer strike a ball cleaner than Bob. No. No, just, not at that's, at, that's at any level, period, especially live. Not one person I've seen strike a ball cleaner. The, um, the inside of his foot, the, the way he used to hit that, I just don't know how. I still to this day, because we, I used to train with him doing the extra sessions. Yeah. The goal, his goal against Man City at Wembley, from outside the box, he passed it in. You know, yeah. other people would have to lace that ball to kick it as hard as he did and he just passed it round the keeper so hard you know he's, he's just incredible well yeah but don't do yourself a disservice you've got a decent one as well to be fair oh no I don't, don't honestly I've got the biggest head in the world I don't do myself <laughs> he, he was brilliant at that you know we all had our attributes that we could do better than other people and Rob's striking and his hold up play and you know we're, he was incredible. So now it's his birthday. That's enough. Now I've given him, given that's him. It, a, yeah, you can give him some. You can give him some chip later. <laughs> yeah, no, but it was. He, he was a great player. But anyway, back to you because we've already spoken about him on another chat. So let's uh, let's blow some smoke up your ass a little bit. <laughs> um, autumn of '98, you scored in five consecutive games. I had a look. You got seven. You got two doubles and uh, and obviously got one goal in each of the other three games. Yeah. I want to talk. It's one of my favourite goals, and it's it's not a you know a, a forty yard volley or something like that. But that game against Luton, the weather was absolutely horrific. Should the game have probably not gone ahead? Looking yeah, back, definitely should. The pitch was ahead. absolutely covered in puddles. It was terrible, and they were doing really well. You know, they were they, they had Thorpe. Was Thorpe still there, or had he gone to Bristol by then? But they they were. Um, that might have been the season after, because remember, weirdly enough, it goes back to Bob again, because Bob said that when he scored his hat-trick against Bristol City the season after, when Pulis came back for the first time, okay. Thorpe was on the bench for Bristol uh, City. Uh, and they were both moaning that they didn't want to come on. Uh, um, but that goal was... I mean, firstly, to, to beat the keeper to it on the halfway line, effectively. Then to have the, the wherewithal to get up in yeah. basically what looked like flood water <laughs> and to, to clip it into the, to an empty net. I don't even think it bounced, did it, before it hit the back of the net? I'm sorry, no, to be fair, lesser to clip it in. That was a full-blooded strike, pal. <laughs> <laughs> that was, no, that was my dad's favourite goal. My, my, my dad passed away six years ago. That goal right. was, he loved it because just to beat the keeper to the ball was one thing. But as yeah. I beat the keeper, if you look in the background, Lenny Lawrence holds his head like that, as though he knew I was going to score. I didn't know. You, you know me, I know me. We don't know if I'm going to pass the ball five yards, let alone shoot first time from 35 <laughs> in the pouring rain. Well, you've so, done well to, to not just slide off into the old and main that, stands because it was, like I say, the pitch was absolutely horrendous. So I fall out of my bed every day. You know, I don't know how I got <laughs> I've got no balance, no sense, sense of gravity or anything. And 
it was just just I was I had so much belief in myself back then. You know, the the fans were there. Whenever I got the ball, they'd expect me to do something. I scored my best ever goal at that ground for Brentford past Jim Stannard, and it didn't. That was get... the season before, wasn't it? I looked at that because I was going through the ninety six ninety seven season when I was researching before you got your move to Reading, and I looked and there was an away game. I was looking down a list of Saba, Taylor, Statham, Smudge, Ashby, all playing for Brentford. I think, I was thinking, could I make some decent signings? Yeah, but it's just, um, it, it's that, that ground. I just had so much belief and I didn't think, you know, if I would have thought about what I was doing, God knows what would have happened, but it was just instinctive and, and thank God it went in. I suppose it's one of them as well, and if you was in like a the middle of a goal drought and you hadn't scored for sort of like ten games, you'd have probably had a touch and thought, "Oh, I'm going to try and offload this to someone else." I would have turned back and passed to to Pato, right back. <laughs> you got it all the way back to Vinny. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> right, let's move a bit further forward. We're getting to that time where we have to talk about Bob Taylor again. I'm afraid. Okay, is it the Burnley match? We, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. So, so, and obviously, we're only talking it in, you know, as a little bit of a wind up. But you've already mentioned it briefly, being on the not like, watching him when he was unplayable that that second season before he's left. But what was you thinking that day at Turf Moor? Everything he had seemed to go in. I think he scuffed a couple as well. I think the centre half helped him out with one. The penalty weren't great, in fairness, but it seemed everything he hit went in. He scored five in an hour, and you played ninety minutes and didn't get one. I know, but I had a good game. I didn't think Bob had a good game. And next day I'm seeing everyone five this, five that, and whatever happened, and there's no there was never any animosity between me and Bob. You know, there's other strike partners you were jealous of. You know, you wanted but with Bob, if he saw me on an open goal, he'd set me up and I'll do the same. So there's never any bitterness like that on the pitch and I, I was always the first to go over to him, but Five. I only wanted one, and I was having to go at Pew. Pew wanted to take. I went, no, leave me. I want to get me one. Exactly. Get him off. He's got his five. I, I want. There's goals here. Yeah, I think it was the 61st minute he came off, and he'd got five. And you're probably oh. thinking, right, like, there's got to be chances now. Yeah, surely. Was, I could. I could have run around that pitch for five days, and I wasn't. And I, I had a good record against Burnley, and that day was just. Oh, here we go. This is the ones I shouldn't have scored, are now coming back to haunt me because. I should have scored a few here and the big fella up above isn't letting me have one. Yeah, I suppose there's some points in some games where you just think it's not going to happen today. Like you said, I could be here for weeks and weeks and weeks and it's just not going to happen. Yeah, but I still didn't want to come off, just in case. <laughs> just in case. case. Yeah, one fell to you. Yeah. I think you yeah. bought on Darren Carr, didn't you? We went all ultra defensive for the last half hour. I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I did try my hardest. But it was, it was great to see someone, you know, score five because... Back in my Brentford days, I scored a hat trick at Shrewsbury in seven minutes. Right. And I got destroyed by the manager after the match because it was my first hat trick. I was prancing around like an absolute tar after I got the third goal. <laughs> and I got in waiting for all these big cuddles, and P- um, Smudger and Ash were crying because Dave Webb. Ruined me. It was one of the biggest batterings I got of a manager I ever received because I should have scored six or seven. And right. what Rob did against Burnley is what I should have done. So it was like, I'm not only watching my strike partner get five in an hour. I'm not only miss, watching myself miss all these chances. I'm going to have Dave Webb ringing me tomorrow saying, see, that's what you should have done against Shrewsbury. Do you see? So you're getting another battering two years later. <laughs> So, um, no, that, that match, I'm glad we've spoken about it. Can, can we move on now? We can, but unfortunately it brings us on to the playoffs. Oh, OK. Here we go. Incidentally, we're, we're talking about something more positive quickly. Just just a memory <laughs> I have was um, Notts County away, final away day of that season. I think you scored the winner. That was one of my favourite away days because we'd already got in the playoffs and it was just an absolute party at, at Meadow Lane. And we won 1-0, I think, didn't we, that day? Yeah, and that, that's a horrible, horrible big ground and it was all bobbly. And it was just nice that we, we didn't get any injuries, you know, nothing significant. Everyone was OK. Um, uh, and it, it put us on a nice, a nice bit for, to prepare for the playoffs. Yeah, right, let's move on to them then. And it seemed, I think, 
that we had battles with Preston, it seemed every season we was sort of challenging each other in the same area of the league, wherever that was. Like I mentioned, like you've mentioned Jim, when Jim arrived, we went up with Preston in 95, 96 from the bottom division. And then we had good battles with them, didn't we? Like the two, two and a half seasons you were there. We yeah. were in, in League One and then the championship as it as it is now. And I remember went to the away leg. Mm. Um, we drew one all. Bob again. Yeah. <laughs> Bainey your life at the moment, isn't he? No, that was, it, it was um, ironic. I think, because I remember the keeper having an absolute belter against us in the league game. Yeah. And we drew one all. David Lucas. Yeah. And then obviously he dropped a ricket for the, for the equaliser up there, didn't he? Yeah. Um, but how good was that second leg? I mean, the early goal really helped as well, didn't it? Again, from Hesse. He had a habit of scoring in playoff semi finals, and we'll talk about another one a bit later. But. So, oh, Hesse was pretty, you know, my time there, the German. Um, I loved him to pieces. I think everyone did. He was the cement of the club. That's why he, he, he'll always be part of Gillingham and that area because he was honest. You, you couldn't fall out with him because if he shouted at you, you'd done something wrong. He, he yeah. hadn't a bad bone. to wouldn't pick or victimise anyone. If you got told off by a Hesse, you, you'd mess up and you deserved it. So he, he led by example um, uh, and it was great for him to get the early goal and that just meant, you know, you can have this little wasp buzzing around you for the next 90 minutes. You better put in a proper shift. Yeah. And like you say, that and we've mentioned it already, I don't think throughout that time from sort of 98 through to 2003, probably after you'd gone and a lot of the boys had left when we finished sort of mid-table in the championship. But I don't think at any time did you ever think there was like someone in there that you thought was a superstar or thought themselves to be a superstar, probably more importantly, like you've said, we everyone would run through brick walls for each other, would look after each other and go to war for each other. And... We was lucky, like we was blessed. We had Iffy, we had you, we had Bob for that 18 months where he was a joke. We had Hesse, we had proper defenders, yeah, Vinny behind them. Good. Even the people that come in that weren't playing from the start were super, like, it didn't diminish the quality at all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what was what was it like thinking we're back at Wembley again? Because obviously your experiences up until then hadn't been the best at Wembley, if I'm correct in thinking. Yeah, I'd lost, lost with Brentford before... Um... Yeah, just horrible, horrible. Um, but there was always a chance to redeem yourself. So we we couldn't get any worse, I don't think. I don't think you, you go to Wembley after what we've been through and nothing nothing could be as bad. So you go there with no pressure, no, no expectations of anything other than, well, it's going to be better than last time. I suppose you have to sort of put that out of your head and say, like, cause, so I suppose you... Was, was Bob in that team with Brentford and Smudger and Baz and... Yeah, yeah, they, they were, they, we all played um, and, yeah, we, we, you know, we did ourselves a dis- disservice. I was playing left midfield against Danny Murphy in that match, um, which, you know, I should have got some percentage of his signing on fee because I let him walk rings around me in that midfield. He looked like Maradona. Playing I think on your Instagram page, isn't there a picture? I think you, there's a picture you put on Instagram. You said it's the only time you've played left midfield in your life. Yeah, but, yeah there was a there was all sorts um, before that match because there was I don't know why I was top goal scorer and doing well in the team of the the se- season, um, and the, the manager decided to play me there. And in, in hindsight, if I would have just accepted it and got my head round this was what I was I've been asked to do I you know I know I tried to but I was definitely sulking from some for some part whereas afterwards he, he said he is the best player in the league Carl and you were our best player at that time and I thought if you could do your stuff going against him it would yeah. distract him you know and that was the logic to it whereas I was an impetuous, you know, idiot at the time who thought was listening to my agent, um, this, that, and the other, uh, and I did myself no justice. And Danny Murphy ended up at Liverpool his next match. So, uh, yeah. But we all learn with age. Yes. Yeah. Back to Wembley '99. Then obviously we've seen off Preston. Um, we've got five of you that are obviously trying to right the wrongs of your Brentford experience and it gets shown about this time every year. It, it does my head in every time the playoffs start coming around, they have to show images of 
Kevin Orlock and Paul Dickoff and Nicky Weaver running 100 laps of Wembley. And quite frankly, it gets on my tits, I won't lie. But um, yeah. what was the day like? Because I've always said, in terms of the occasion, the Man City was better than the Wigan day out. And oh. I said to Bob the other day, I think that if you could merge, or no, to Vinny, I said, if you could merge the two and have the crowd and the atmosphere and the day out from the City fixture, but with the Wigan ending, it'd probably be the perfect playoff final. Yeah. But we can't do that. I asked Finney, he's, I put his finger on it, he says, it's just one of them. But you must have thought at 2-0 at with the final whistle set to be blown that we're getting promoted here and we're beating Man City in front of nearly 80,000 people, surely. It was the best best occasion. Um, the, the Man City, you know, and everything about that day was brilliant because it was, it was drizzly, it was good playing, because I hated playing in the sun, I loved the rain. It was overcast. You're playing full Wembley. You've got the Gallagher brothers being interviewed before the match saying they're worried about you. You know, hearing your name being said by these, oh, my God, the Gallagher brothers now are so up. My God. You know, my mum, it was perfect. And, you know, after the first 20 minutes, yep. we were still in this. It was like, oh, this this is, you know, we got a shot at this. This We can grind them because you trusted Smudger. You trusted Ash. You knew that, they're going to give in before we do because we got we got proper rock solid people here. So yeah. I, I didn't think we were going to lose. You know, I fancied it. And then when Paul popped the ball through to me and my big toe popped the ball past Weaver, this this is going to be the greatest day ever. You know, I've got my goal, I've slid off. Then Rob scored his thunderbolt from outside that, you know, and it was, I just loved that goal. Uh, I did a nice back heel to him. Yeah. Um, and that was it. But I'd been playing for maybe five weeks with ripped adductors and stomach muscles. And, you know, I was coughing up blood after matches because of the amount of painkillers I was on. So we knew I was having operation in the summer. So you knew in advance that was going to be your final game for... Yeah, and I, I, I was in a bad way on the pitch. So it wasn't, you know, my family, oh, why did he take you... I was I was struggling and yes. he was shoring it up. So we're 2-0 up with a few minutes to go. You know, he's done nothing wrong. It was just fate. And as I say, I'm massive in cars. I, I love my cars. Yep. And I had a picture of the car that if we went up, I was going to get. I right. was going to... I'm I'm showing this picture to um, Andy Morrison on the other because I like Jock and he was good. I'm going, yeah, I'll take you for a drive. I'll take you for a spin, Jock, on the other bench. Oh, no. No, I'm, maybe I jinxed it. I don't know. But those goals, the, everything about the, I think it's the, the first one when it went, when Hall at school. What a great tackle. You know, the last ditch left foot from, was it Ash? So I, I think it's Carl. I think I've said this to Vinny and I said it to Chris Oak as well. I think and Bob, I think both of them are Darren Carl. But that tackle but is incredible. He's got the wrong leg, isn't it? And he gets a blocker and it lands right at the feet of Borlock. And, and that goes in, but it could have gone anywhere. He could have done a terrible tackle and it would have bobbled away and they never got us. But it was just fate, you know, and that's why we love football, because it's so unpredictable. And you know, they, they beat us on penalties. They didn't beat us in the game. They beat us on penalties. And that will never, you know, we, we did the best we could. Everybody in Gillingham was proud of us. Yeah, and yeah not taken away from that, not at all. We, we, we'll, you know, as you say, it's shown every year because it, it was such a great effort from the boys. And I don't really remember much of the Wigan match because... We, we'd done it all in the Man City. That was more of justification of the season before. Um, yeah, I suppose it was almost a case of let's just make sure we get the job done this time and can, uh, can the we, Wigan one. But back to that City one. So you was on the bench by the time Orlock scored. Yeah. What was the feeling on the bench then? Cause was, was Bob was off by then as well, weren't he? Oh, one sec. Can I, can I go? Yeah, no worries. Of course, Ken. You'll be... Sorry. Benefits of live recording. <laughs> Sorry about that. Oh, That's all right. No sorry. worries. 
I just said that's the, that's the benefits of live recording. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. Um, just that Stephen, when they scored it, well, you know, we just got to kill this. They're not going to get another. Uh, and just disbelief. And then the, uh, in between, before the penalty, before extra time, mm. I went to the toilet and Joe Royal was there. And he was just, he was giggling. He was giggling. He said, how, how have we got out of this? Yeah. And, you know, it was no consolation to me, but just they knew how lucky they were. Yeah, I think because after the game, everyone said Gilles were a better side and City had got away with one. But like you say, that didn't make us feel any better as, as you as players and us certainly not as fans. I said to all the other boys that I've spoken to that I got a train journey back from London all the way to Kent and it was silent all the way. And yeah. I've never known anything like it. And it was... You just felt unbelievably empty, like, and it didn't matter what people saying. Oh, you had a good go. We were two 0 up in injury time against Man City in front of eighty thousand people, including the, the Gallagher brothers, like you say at Wembley. And it all got snatched away, and yeah. um, I remember. I don't know if you've watched it back, but I'm sure in extra time there's there's a massive call. We should have a penalty as well. I'm sure Hodgie whips a ball in, and their right back sticks his arm and it's him. Is it was it Jeff Whitley was the right back? Yeah. I'm, not, I'm sure I'm it hits him on the arm, but it just seemed to sort of pass by with no one really appealing. I don't know whether we were sort of in a state of shock because of what had happened in injury time, but and then the less said about the penalties, the better, unfortunately. But we could only send up those that were on the pitch, couldn't we? But did AD hit the post as well, Carl? Pardon? Did AD hit the post? I'm not. Honestly, I can't remember. Because from our angle, it just looked like he blazed it a million miles wide. But yeah. I'm sure I've heard somewhere that it clipped the post and the angle where we were as fans, it made it look like a worse penalty. But Well, I can't remember. I'm not even sure where I was, whether I was looking. I, I don't remember the penalties. I don't. I remember them on TV. Yeah. But I, don't, I don't remember Seeing their live. Blue Moon, you know. And I went to watch... Man City, Man United, a couple of months ago in my, my Little Ones, the semi final of the the League Cup. Yeah. And it's played, you know, as you say, it's always played every year. They play it every match on their big screens, the Dickoff and the Weaver and that. We're part of their history, you know, it's it is significant. Yeah, because I think there was at the time there was talk of them having massive money problems, and they had to get out of that division, otherwise they were in real trouble financially. Yeah. So, and then you just look where they are now, and you just think, oh, "That's right." Is it fair? <laughs> but, oh, no. but we, you mentioned your injury, and you was playing with groin problems, adductor problems throughout the final few weeks of that season. How frustrating was it for you then, after you know that heartache at Wembley, to then have to sit on the sidelines for the first? what was it, August, September, October, about the first six months of the following season. And yeah. obviously it all changed. Tony had gone, Peter Taylor had come in. Did you know much about him at the time? Or well, he was England felt... under-21 manager, wasn't he, before he, he came to England us? England under-21, but I had fallen out with, with the world at that time because of the operations weren't good. Yeah, and one of them went really badly and had to be redone. And it was, woe is me. You know, I, I was... And what, what made things worse was Rob was scoring. And it's like, I'm yeah. not having the forgotten child. My partner's scoring freely, being linked with every club under the sun where I believe I'm better than him. You know, that's my mentality. Yeah. I want to be playing. Of course. Get a call, call from the, you know, get a call from the club saying, well, you've got to come in for this photo shoot with Peter Taylor. And, well, no, I don't. I'm getting my groin right. I fell, so I fell out with PT, who I love. But right. I'd never even met him, but I refused to go in because, well, a three-hour drive isn't going to do my groin any good or my yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's probably not ideal. So just let me let me rehab my own way because I want to be playing sooner than anybody else. So if it's good for me, I'll do it. If it's not good for me and it's going to delay me coming back, I'm not doing it. So well, that's that, helping. It's not helping the club either, is it? If you're out for because yeah, what was it? Because t- I'm trying to think. Obviously, cause it's nearly 20 years ago now, which is yeah. frightening in itself, but. You wasn't meant to be out for that long, was you? It wasn't. Like six, no, it, six, seven they thought, months. They thought it was a normal, like a hernia. Yeah. But, like anything with me, it's not going to be normal because I, I'm just weird. So <laughs> they, ended up, they ended up cutting my adductor, ab, adductor, you know, the, the long one that goes upside the inside of your thighs. They cut yep. those to make them longer. They cut my lower abdominal muscles to make because I just 
turns into one big ab, basically. I've done too much, many crunches and leg exercises without stretching, and it just compacted. So they got oh, right. mesh inside me, and it it just took a while. Um, and I'm not well. I'm not like one of these guys you'll see in gangs of London who can get on with things and are. Uh, I'm a wuss. So if it will take someone six weeks to heal, it will take me seven weeks. Right. <laughs> Literally, I suppose. No, be, being honest with everyone, I'm, I was pretty weak like that, but, you know, I gave me all when I was fit. Um, yeah, of course. But it was really hard watching. It was hard watching because you, you're not sure if you're going to play again because they didn't know, well, I've still got this pain. Is it going to go? Is it going to go? Yeah, it's going to go. It's not gone. So they, they operated again. And when they did the, the I think it was the third on my groin i didn't know if i was coming back at all um yes yeah, so that's supposing you was so, only what then you were still only mid to late 20s weren't you so it's not not like you, you're at the end of your career and you think oh well i've had a good career yeah and that will, that, be, will be type thing that sort of came back to play the following year with my contract and everything because how you know how close i was to not playing again with that groin it it makes you think well you know, your, your, your time in this game is limited and you've got to look after you. And, and that, you know, that's basically, you know, we'll touch on that later, but it, it was hard. But PT was brilliant with me. And once we did start, you know, getting back, he was definitely the manager I needed because he had so much belief in me. Um, yeah, it was probably the, the sort of the worst half a season to miss in the sense because we didn't start great so I suppose you're thinking oh I could be out there and helping us then you say your strike partner starts slapping everything in from every every part of the pitch possible yeah. <laughs> I mean he's coming off the bench scoring at tricks when he's not fit and you're probably thinking Christ this ain't fair is it I'm sat up in a stand again or whatever and and I was and also I was having to watch Junior Lewis and anyone who knows he, he's just a miracle of science I didn't know whether he was a pterodactyl <laughs> I so I wasn't training every day. I didn't know, you know, what is. You didn't see if he was undressed, if he had another arm, because he was just a weird person. So there was a lot that needed clearing up, and um, I wanted to get back as soon as possible. Well, you did eventually in the February, and I suppose a little bit of, you know, silver silver lining on the on the dark cloud. I suppose was. It wasn't a bad place to make your first appearance of the season, Stamford Bridge. Yeah, it was brilliant. Um, against and young... you started as well, didn't you, if I remember rightly? No, I don't think I did. Did you not? I, thought, I think, I don't know. I thought I came on because I remember getting hammered by the Chelsea fans warming up. Let me look. I'm not, are you going to check? I will check quickly. I'm not sure, but I remember it was Desai and John Terry, and John Terry was... He was not to be messed with. He was a young whippersnapper and he was frightening. He scored his first goal for them that day as well, didn't he? Oh, did he score from the corner? I'm sure he did, yeah. He got one of the one header in the second half, yeah. But they it wasn't Deschamps playing or it was a frightening team. They had Deschamps, they had LeBeuf, I think they had Desai, I think Poyet played, they had George Weir up front. It was yeah, a joke. It wasn't bad. I suppose five nil weren't so bad when you look at it like that. Oh, not at all. Not at all. Oh, no, you came on just after half-time. You're correct. Sorry, that's my error. You came on for 80 at half-time. OK, brilliant. Yeah, Tor Andre Flo, John Terry, George Weir, Gianfranco Zola and a young Jody Morris as well. That oh, was well, I, uh, he's, I was with him at, um, at Millwall in my, my last season. Joe, what a great lad he is. I'm glad he's, you know... He was just an incredible footballer. Um, well, he's Lampard's assistant at Chelsea now, I think, isn't he? Doing so well, yeah. So the, the young uns there will learn a lot from him. That boy knows how to keep keep the ball and how to play. Yeah, just spoke the manager up weren't too bad. He, yeah. <laughs> he, he wasn't bad. He, he was done all right for himself, I suppose. <laughs> um, right, moving through that season a little bit quicker now. Um, you finally got yourself back playing and I think you played about 14 or 15 times the back end of that season, which I suppose, considering you thought you might not play again at some point, wasn't wasn't bad. And I think you got, weirdly, you only scored in three games, I think, but you got a hat-trick in one, two in another and one in another. Yeah. And that hat-trick was at home to Cardiff. I think it was the last home fixture of the regular season. Yeah. I, I fell out with two of my old teammates as well from Reading. Um, 
Jason Bowen and Andy Legg. They were both in the side that day, were they? Yeah, Leggy got sent off as well. And um, I think it it was for trying to pull me down or do something, he got sent off. Right. And I'm sure I cheerioed him as he was get, got his marching order. So I apologise <laughs> for that. Because he was a good lad. And I didn't know that they were going to get relegated as well. Oh, so they got relegated at the end of that season, didn't they, yeah, as well? Yeah. No, that game. I'm sure it was that game got him relegated. It might have been that game that sent him down, yeah. I yeah, right. I, cheer- I cheerioed him and got him sent off and relegated him. So, sorry, Leggy. Um, but 20, 20 years yeah. later, he apologises. Yeah, <laughs> great game. Loved that. That was one of my favourite goals. If he set me up first time and it just bent the one the one we always tried every day at training that I never did actually went in on at Priestfield so I was buzzing about that I suppose it sort of set you up nicely because not only obviously goalie scoring goals is what you're meant to be doing as a striker but it probably you probably thought yeah I'm all right here the groin's all right I can still do this I can still do a job at this level and maybe a bit higher and then we had to go to to Wrexham on the final day knowing that we would win it would take us up automatically. I think it was behind, was it behind Burnley? Was it? I'm not sure. I'm not I sure. Know, Preston were up there again and um, we lost. We should have <laughs> gone. The keeper it, saved everything and I think yeah. the right back scored an absolute howitzer. I don't think he scored again in his career, but it was typical Jules, I suppose, that we were going to do it the most difficult way possible, weren't it? Yeah, for definite. Um, I don't know. It wasn't complacency. I, that we, it was just what, another one of those... As you say, the keeper had a worldie and someone scored a goal they'd never do again. It wasn't a nil-nil drab, got beaten by a bobbly in goal. Oh, no, we created absolutely loads as well. Yeah, um, there was one I went through and I, it, was, it, was a, it was a simple, just lobbed the keeper goal. Oh, was that, was, I couldn't remember if it was you or if he clipped it and landed on the roof of the net, I think, yeah. didn't it? Yeah, and I, 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 you know, I didn't know, I think that it was at nil-nil or something, I or whatever, it was enough time for us to go on and get another anyway, and I, I missed yeah. it, so, stinker. But Wembley, it was the chairman's dream, go up via Wembley, more money. Well, that's it, yeah, I suppose you get all the TV revenue, So, if, but it's obviously there's no guarantee, so it's, mm. um, you know, rock and hard place, so to speak, but we had Stoke in the playoffs that year, and um, quickly, though, what was, what was the mindset after the Wrexham game then? Because I know PT went round to the Jills fans. He walked right around the front of all of us and was shaking hands with those at the front and saying, we'll get the job done at Wembley and don't worry, we're still going up. And I, I thought at the time that probably sort of settled us down as supporters a little bit, that the, the yeah. belief was still there. But in terms of the dressing room, did it did it ever waver, the belief that you'd get it done in the playoffs? Or? I don't know. While he was out there shaking hands saying we'd get it done, we were probably trying to get on the chain and hide. <laughs> he had faith in Wembley because we didn't you know so many of us had lost whatever we did I, you know driving through Wembley I'd lose something after those games so um, it, it was just a, a case of look you've done the season you're playing against teams that you, you're, you're on the same level as as long as you work your hardest you've got a chance so we weren't worried you know what 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 could go go worse for the other boys that's happened before. You know, we can only lose another time. Well, yeah, then I suppose you get to keep Wembley, don't you, if you lose every time. <laughs> yeah, but you had other players. That, that was a good thing. You had people who hadn't been through this. You had Tomo. You had, you had Butts. You had Ippy. You had who, who wanted, you know, they hadn't been there the last couple of years. And, and they, if anything, encouraged us. You know, the people who would have had a little bit, oh, here we go again, you know, what are you talking about? You know, we're yeah, really winning. Two of, the, two, of the, two of the boys that played, you know, big parts in the, the two crucial goals at the end weren't there for the year before, were they? Ty and, and yeah. Junior Lewis, who you've already spoken about, they'd come in that season. So they probably weren't, you know, they weren't scarred by that as much as you lot were. Yeah, no, Junior Scott is, um, is uh, <laughs> no, uh, I'll leave it. Yeah, th- those, those boys were big parts and Tomo, if you needed goals, Tom, Tomo had goals, you know. He was a great finisher and get the ball in the net anyway, as, as he did with his, his with his header. Yeah. But what was it like, Stoke first? Because you didn't play in the away leg, did you? I didn't play. I don't know what, what was that. Was it a suspension or was it an injury? I'm not sure because I, I don't think he was even on the bench. I wasn't at the match. 
Oh, you didn't even go? I know. I'm not sure what happened there. It may have been some... I, I really haven't got a clue. Let me just have a quick look then. Because you, you can't have been suspended. You didn't play enough, sure. <laughs> yeah, no, I was, a, I was a boisterous, you know, leave my foot in there and there. I was an evil, evil player, me. 99. You, you did two red cards with us, weren't it, I think? <laughs> I don't know. Um... Mm. No, it can't have been suspension. In, in fairness to you, he was an angel at the back end of that season, mate. You didn't pick up a yellow card. Yeah, I was probably not fit enough to. Um, but, I was going to say, was he maybe protecting you because of the fact that you'd, you'd only come back a couple of months previously? I, I don't know. But. I'm not sure. It might have, but I, I will have had some form of injury. Whether it was a, for me not to travel, it will have only been a soft, you know, either a bruise, whether I kicked something, because I was fine for the second that. Well, yeah, because you played, you must have been a training injury because you played obviously the last two or three games. Like I said, the last home game was Cardiff, you relegated them. Then you played in the Wrexham game. Yeah, I'm not sure what it was then. I really haven't no. got a clue. So, so, what did you watch the game on telly then? or? I watched it on TV. Um, I watched it on TV. I can't, I can't actually, I haven't got a clue. But I will have watched it on TV, I, you know. But for me not to have been at the game, it's an injury, and Must I would have been, been sure, doing yeah. whatever I needed to do to be ready for the next match. So, so I suppose we didn't start great. Right? I think we were two 0 down inside ten minutes. Yeah, and we're probably thinking, here we go again. It's the playoffs, and it's Gillingham, and it's going to end horribly. But yeah. I mean, Ty got Ty got one back before half time, didn't we? And then we conceded again. But then, can you remember your reaction to Hesse smashing one in from about half a mile? It was. Just, just happy for his little face. You know? <laughs> Not even, I weren't even thinking about the bigger implications. It's just his happiness, you know. Oh, you know, wanting to talk to him about this goal he'd scored. You know, it was that good. Um, yeah, it was, it was an, one hell of a hit. To be fair, it's probably the only place he could put it as well. And but then you, you also knew you were coming back to Priestfield, and we, we, you believed in us. It wasn't you we could have been three 0 down. I would have still believed we'd do it at Priestfield because it's us. Yes. Uh, no, no. I'm, I just I remember the Man City year much more. I, I, I don't know why. Maybe because it's it's seen much more. But all the, the Stoke one, I, it's pretty hazy to me. I remember the celebration afterwards going round. Um, because that was a really nice celebration. That that was really good after the the, the home match against Stoke. Yeah, because it was three 0 and we ended up. It looked comfortable in the end, didn't it? Because they had two players sent off before the hour, and um, but I think they were still in it right up till the end. They hit the post at nil nil, I think, or one nil, and then it's one of the sending offs I didn't think was was it. I thought one of them we were lucky for him to go. I think they were both because I'm sure that. Kavanagh was one, wasn't he? I think it was for two yellows, a couple of tackles. And then I think, was it Clive Clark might have gone for chucking the ball away? Okay, yeah, Clark. Okay, yeah. yeah. Um, I can't but remember. Again, it's, it's 20 years ago. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to remember as best I can. But uh, I've been watching all these, um, these prime suspect things about people who are forgetting what they were doing 20 years ago. And so, of course, you remember if you... I can't remember these important matches, half of them. <laughs> yeah, I've shown you up here a little. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Wembley, then. do you remember much about Wembley? Or I remember Iffy scoring after my little Maisie run and cross, and I was trying to get it because he, he was my best friend. You know, he's godfather to all three of my kids. Oh, is he? Um, oh, lovely. I was trying to get that goal overturned in the record books as an own goal. <laughs> I would have said give it to him. He's got a... Because the, the thing for me, all jokes oh, aside, is, is if you, you have a shot and it's on target and yeah. it hits the defender and goes in, it's classed as a deflection, it's the strikers go. Well, if he gets a touch before it hits the centre-half, so just give it to Iffy. Oh, quite, no, it's not even that. It's his present. If, if it was any other player than Iffy, the defender would have been able to deal with it. It's just if he was hulking, he'd love me saying that because hulking in the programme is... Um, no one else would have got that. You know, he, he did incredible, but it still didn't stop me trying to get it taken off him. And uh, I thought there was a chance I could get it myself, actually. I just <laughs> I'm not sure you could claim it. <laughs> but it wouldn't stop me trying. As always, put a hand up on every goal. You never know what, what will That's happen. It, yeah, if you run off and look convincing towards the corner flag, <laughs> well, you don't want to waste time. We'll get stuck by that again, won't we? <laughs> but no, that was... It was... The, the other goals were good. Tomo's goal was just... Yeah. Happy days.
What was the thinking at, at 2-1 again? Obviously, they got back level. They scored a really good goal. And then they went down to 10 men for the, the right back, went for a foul on, on Nicky South, which was second yellow. And, mm. and then Ash gave away what still looks like a very soft penalty. What were we thinking then? Were we thinking, was there any sort of sense of deja vu? Because Vinny said, no, it was just a case of we've got to get a leveller here. So you didn't even sort of think about the previous year. Was was that the mindset amongst all of you? Or did any of you sort of think? No. Oh, uh, it again? No, it was just win. It's win because you can't go through that pain again. You didn't know what was going to happen. If you lost, God knows what would have happened to us. You know, half of us would have been having counselling for the next two seasons. So that would have been that would have been a few of you would have had three Wembley defeats, wouldn't you? Then with yeah. the Brentford one as well. Yeah, so I'd imagine it would have been hard to come back from that yet again. Stop quit t- twisting the knife. Yes, yes, I remember them all. Um, but <laughs> so you, no, yeah, then you can't remember this one. <laughs> but no, yeah, exactly, because this one was there was no pain associated with this one. It was just happy times and like. Final, finally getting what you what you didn't get the previous three times, oh, two times. It, it was. Um, I suppose you, you remember the pain because it probably drives you on, doesn't it? Yeah. Like you say, whereas the, the one that you've enjoyed is it's no motivation to you know do it again. In a, yeah. in a, in a sense, no. It, it, but it was good. I didn't think we'd lose it, um, and we had goals. That was the thing. We did have goals in the pitch. You had butts. You had myself. You had if you oh. had. Yeah, I think we had effectively four up front, didn't we, for the last 15 minutes? So if any any team's going to score, it's ours, and thankfully it, it, it happened. Yeah, you're right. And like, they're two really good goals as well. You've already said that. The first one, I think Junior Did drops the shoulder and comes back, and, and that's the butler header, isn't it? Right yeah. into the roof of the net. And so that ball from How great was it for him? At what, 38? I think, is he still the, one of the oldest Wembley playoff final scorers, I think? Is he? But he was in great shape, you know, he, he was a military guy, wasn't he? He was, I think he was so, yeah. a, a proper zero body fat and just looked after himself so well and uh, could score. He was a great striker, a lovely man, and it, you, were, you were happy for him to score. It was a, that was a lot of the thing where you weren't thinking about the result. You think just it's nice for that person to to get the recognition, get the goal that they deserved and to see people happy for them. It, it was really, it was, I sound like a weird striker because it should be me, 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 but you're happy for other people to score because... Yeah, you don't come across as the stereotypical type in that sense. You keep oh. saying, I'll roll it off if I've got an open goal, I'll give it to my strike partner, I'm happy for him. Whereas most people, they go, no, it's me, I want to score, I want to get that one, I'm going to go round the keeper. But no, it worked for you. Yeah, because I, yeah, I had that relationship with Nicky Forster. I love Nicky, but me and him in training, we used to almost fight because we wanted to score more than each other. We were always on opposite teams, and that wasn't yeah. a healthy, healthy relationship. Um, whereas with Bob, it was just about scoring or butts or iffy. You know, yeah. we lived next door to each other, and if it was me and Nicky, we would have burnt each other's wats down. You know, me and if he used to well, tune the bake here, if you want some, you know, and he'd cook. It was just, you're happy as a team for winning. And that, that was the biggest part of the, the Wigan win for me was, it wasn't about one player. It wasn't about this person had a standout match. It was everyone dug in. Yeah. And Tomo, not the, the key person in the dressing room. He was a shy and assuming guy. He he was the focal point, and it was lovely. Yeah. So no, it was good. And I suppose the the emotion when he's header at the back of the net must have been unbelievable. I mean, for fans, it was brilliant. So, but, but to be out there and to you know relief, kind of relief, and 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 right all the wrongs of the previous experiences that you, a few of you had had must have been Complete. pretty overwhelming. I suppose wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, it it really was, and. I was glad, in a way, that it wasn't like myself or or Smudge or one of the people who'd been through it who scored because it it was nice to just be able to get the release without the camera on you, you know, just be able to exhale. But that's yeah. how I felt. It was like, oh, fan, it's done, you know. And the pressure. Well, from a personal point of view, from the the horrors of your first half of that season, it was probably a, a nice way to. To end it after all the the traumas with the injury. Yeah, completely. No, it was, and it was just 
just nice. You know, the manager had done well. We we're playing a different type of football. The fans had stuck with us, and but you know, it's expensive. You know, going here and there, and to keep going all around the country and not getting a win it must have been draining on on the fans as well. So it was it was nice for them all. Oh yeah, it was, and it. Like I say, if we could, if you could bottle that emotion up, you'd, you'd make millions. But you can't, and it's mm. it's something we just all have to sit on, sit and look back on now, twenty years later, and, and watch YouTube videos because it'd be great to go back to that day again. But we all know that's not possible. But mm. we've spoken about change of manager, so I've got one final question before I let you go and get on with your day. Obviously, PT left at the end of that season, I think, and went to Leicester in the Premier League. Yeah, um, and you played under Hesse in the championship or the old division one as it was then he scored 12 times in 28 games that season before leaving and going off to Sheffield United um, I think you touched on it earlier so I'm going to ask firstly how did that move come about because you'd spent all your life down south around London and the south east and then all of a sudden you're moving up to Yorkshire was there I remember contract issues or something at the time and because we got on. we got bugger all for you. I think we got about ninety thousand for you, which was ridiculous Nin- at the time. Ninety-two, but it was that before Christmas. I was going to Leicester. You know, again, another like Bob Taylor situation where the manager had invested in a striker and it wasn't paying off. Um, he bought. Oh, so you could have you could have followed PT up to Philbert Street. Yeah, I thought um, myself and Edgy was supposed to be going. Right, okay. Um, because he'd spent five million on Addy and it wasn't working. No, it didn't, unfortunately, for Addy, did it? Oh, Addy's one of my best friends. You know, I love Addy to pieces. Um, Can you do me a favour? Yes. Can you tell him to reply to my message on Twitter? I'm trying to get him on the channel. <laughs> oh, you, you, he's very private, like all that, Addy. He does, yeah, I've noticed he's not been on there for months. But if, you know, if you do speak to him, okay. um, it would be appreciated. It, it was, I was supposed to go there before Christmas. Then, when it became apparent, then well, it, he's not going to go. He, yeah. and my contract was up in June. I ended up being uh, used, I'd say, in a in a way that really messed me up with my childhood team, Crystal Palace. You know, I was because yeah, there was big rumours of you going there, wasn't there? They would agreed the deal. The chairman, I, can't, I we think we played away at Sellers Park. Yeah. And uh, Scully and I've forgotten his name now. He hates me and hammers me every week. Uh, Jordan came in and I did agree the deal uh, um, for me to sign for Palace. Yeah. And it was just when the boys we were going we were going off to La Manga, Gillingham. Right. Uh, so I wasn't able to go away with the lads because we were having you know talk doing the talks with um, Palace. And yeah. it, it seemed like it was all just, well, he's not going to go. His contract's up. The only team he may sign for is Palace. So, it, you know, Palace didn't need me. They, they had um, Clinton. They didn't play my kind of football. They weren't going to pay the mate wages that I would have got anywhere else. And it was like, well, sign for us now. We'll probably give a lump sum back to Gillingham so they get some form of money and we have an asset that if he doesn't work out in six months, we can sell for the market value of a player with three years contract behind him. And it, oh, right. So it's almost like you're just being used as some sort of pawn in a game, so to speak. Yeah, whereas the, the, the way I would have, it would have been nicer is if Gillingham, I would have resigned with Gillingham for three years. Even if they wanted to sell me, they needed yeah. to give me a contract because of my injuries. You know, I just almost lost my career a year before, yeah, you you give me a three year contract on the money I'm going to get wherever I'm going to play, and then sell me. You could have got three million. You never know. I was going to Leicester for one and a half. They just sold me for eight hundred to Palace with six months on my contract. So, so that's what the fee would have been if he was going to Palace. That uh, they'd agreed eight hundred thousand. Makes me feel even worse now. Cheers for that. <laughs> uh, um, and it was, well, I don't want to go to Palace just for the hell of it. And then it came out, Jordan was tell, telling the world that he wanted 20 million, uh, 20,000 a week and a million pound image rights. I, I was a Bosnian. I'd just been agreed a one and a half million deal to Leicester. So that's yeah. my value. Clearly in the market, it's one and a half million. If I wait three months, 
I'm a one and a half million pound asset where someone's going to give me a million because they're saving themselves half. It, it was saving themselves a transfer fee, yeah. They're saving themselves a transfer fee. So let's be sensible, lads. You know, he's he's got a, a a limited time in this in this game. He's not the greatest footballer. He may have a crap season the next year and be worth hundred grand. So he's got to maximise things while he had a chance. But it was as though Simon Jordan and didn't want, he resented footballers earning money. Um, whereas Scally, Paul, Paul was the man who deserved money because he'd paid my contract for three years. He'd been through the injuries with me. Yeah. And we wanted to sign with Gillingham to give Gillingham a chance to get what they deserved. But it was seen that if they gave me the money that I would have got, you then have Smudger probably going in wanting more money because the threshold would have been raised then. Of course. So I, I know it was just difficult. And the, the worst thing of it all was the Jills fans who brought me back to life. You know, when I came from Reading, I was on the floor. Yeah. The Jules fans gave me a belief in myself. They, my time at Gillingham, I couldn't have asked for nicer fans. You know, we had such great times. They hated me. And that's the one thing I regret from it all, was I never got a chance because of how I am. I wouldn't go on Sock AM. I wouldn't go on it because I, I don't really, I didn't want all that. I just wanted to play football. But I yeah. never got my side of the story. And yeah, they, they tried to use me to go to my childhood team. I, I now support Arsenal because I hate Palace. After what Jordan, did you then, yeah. You know, my dad went in there to for contract talks and it, you know my dad's my dad uh, came from nigeria when he was 17 with a suitcase he's no airs or graces and simon jordan sits him in the office does his intercom to get his beautiful receptionist to come in and light his cigar or you know in front of my dad it was just horrible wow. horrible heart and my dad said i don't care what they're going to pay you you're not going to play for them it's not going really right. go in there so it, it was, and no one ever got to hear that side of it. It was all Simon Jordan. Oh, he wants image rights. Who's his image? He's not, I wouldn't buy it. You know, I've got a mouse map with myself from Brentford. I wouldn't pay 2p for this. I didn't want a million pounds for image rights. I've got no image. It was because my market value was one and a half million. Yeah. You're going to sell yourself half a million, Mr. Jordan. You know, it's, it, it was just frustrating. And unfortunately, the Gillingham fans... And they only got the bad side of it, and someone that they supported and bought his shirt, looking like he's he's selling them out for a few pounds, and it wasn't like yeah, that. Yeah, I remember at the time, and uh, that it it was it was coming across in the obviously because the internet wasn't massive then, it was still yeah. mainly newspapers and stuff like that. But I remember at the time, sort of reading local papers that you were coming across as some sort of money grabbing mercenary. Yeah, so I but suppose I at least you've money, had your chance now to sort of put your side of the story across. Yeah, Wigan, I, I was going to train and I had David Moyes ring me, prep, every, all these clubs, and it was all the Northern ones, to be fair. As you say, I, I've always been in the South. All the Northern clubs were all going to pack, you know, I had five clubs offering the same money, and we yeah. went to Chef U because, you know, it was a massive club, and Warnock was like a pew. You, if, you, if he's signing you, he's protecting he you from all the missiles, anything that because he believes in you. And, you know, I had great times at Sheffield, like I did at Gillingham, because I was signing for the right man and the right fans who respected hard work. And you felt valued as a player, yeah, rather than just, Completely. you know, an asset that could be just sold on for a profit. Completely. And, he, he, you know, Warnock was like, Pew, he got people who had something to prove and had proven character that they will dig in and they'll give you all they got. So... It was nice, whereas the other clubs didn't. I didn't feel they knew much about me and saw me more as an asset sure. than what my actual attributes are and what I can do for the team. It was like, well, we're going to get in cheap. If it doesn't work out, we'll sell him on again. And I didn't want that. No, of course you don't. You, you want to be like you say. You want to be valued as a footballer rather than just a commodity. Yeah. So no. So it was a shame. Like my my next trips to Priestfield were horrible. They were yeah. horrible because you, the, the Gillingham fans, let me tell you, you boys make lots of noise. And when you boo, you boo. <laughs> the person stays booed. Um, well, 
hopefully now you've had your chance and once we put this up on the channel, hopefully people will watch it and, you know, realise that it, it wasn't coming from you, it was coming from, from other places. And I get lots of contact, you know, I get lots of messages on Instagram and on on uh, Facebook from so many lovely Gillingham fans. You know, they're, they're wonderful with me now because they, they look back on the history and I scored goals. And But at the time, the, it was just raw emotion and, and they only, you know... They do what they, they want they, they, they feel to do. So there's no hard grudges and you know, I'm part of the history. Well that's it, and that's what I've said to you know to Vinny and Bob and, and Chris Oak. The, the thing is you played a huge part in certainly the most successful well, the most successful Gillingham team since we've been in existence because you helped us get into the championship where we'd never ever dared to get before. Yeah. But no, and the biggest thing is all that is because of Mr. Scully buying the club. And sticking by it, he gets a lot of stick, but the club gets a lot of undue business. stick. And I'm, well, I'm obviously in the age group where I went to the Halifax game in '93. Nine, if we got beat, we weren't going to have a football club to moan about the year after. And again, the younger fans like to say, "Well, that doesn't mean we shouldn't have ambition," and it doesn't. We'd love to be in the Championship. We'd, I'm not sure I'd like to be in the Premier League anymore. I, I don't like the Premier League anymore with all the VAR and the nonsense up there, but I don't think it's football. It's becoming a computer game and that's just, well, that's for another chat. We'd be here for another hour, but <laughs> there's nothing wrong with having ambition and wanting to be the best you can be, but you have to have realism and, and realise that yeah. the size we are and the budgets we have, we're probably, at the moment, we're probably where we should be. Yeah. But yeah. you never know. We've got nine games left and we've still got half a chance of the playoffs if we ever get playing football again, but... yeah. Carl, I've just 70 minutes we've been doing this. It's been an absolute pleasure. Okay. I'm you glad I managed to track you down because you are quite private now. You don't do Twitter and stuff like that, which is probably a good thing. But um, it's been really enjoyable and I appreciate you coming on and spending time chatting. No problem. Okay, thanks a lot. You no take worries. Care. Right, Jill's fans, you know where we are um, on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and YouTube. Um, you can follow Carl on Instagram. Down look at pictures of his, his cars. That's his passion now. Um <laughs> And yeah, just send him a message. Tell him that you enjoyed watching all his goals. Anyway, keep safe. Keep doing um, what the government tell us. And until next time, up the jewels. Take care.